All right, here we go. So, opening the Talmud, a course for beginners. And um, I always like to start with a joke, something to lighten the mood and get everyone laughing. So there's a famous joke, I think it's the Talmud joke, um, when it comes to studying the Talmud and understanding the Talmudic way of thinking. Okay, the story goes like this. There's a young man in his, uh, in his 20s, he knocks on the door of a great rabbi and scholar. Uh, let's call him Rabbi Schwartz. And he says, uh, hey, my name is, is, uh, my name is Sean, and I've come to you because I want to study the Talmud. So the rabbi says, uh, well, do you know how to study? Do you know Aramaic? Because the Talmud is written in Aramaic. And the man says, no. So the rabbi says, do you, do you know how to read Hebrew? Sean says, no, I don't know how to read Hebrew. He says, have you ever studied the Torah? And... Uh, he says, no, Rabbi, but don't worry. I, you know, I graduated Berkeley uh, with a degree in philosophy, and I just finished my doctorate at Harvard on Socratic logic, the Socratic method. So I just, you know, I just want to round out my education by, by uh, a little bit of study of the Talmud. The rabbi says, uh, I doubt you're ready to, st to start studying Talmud. You know, it's the deepest book of the Jewish religion. Uh, but if you want, I'll give you a little logic test and if you can pass that logic test, then I'll teach you Talmud. So Sean agrees. So the rabbi says uh, as follows. Here's, here's the logic test, okay? Two men come down the chimney. One comes out with a clean face and the other comes out with a dirty face. Which one of them washes his face? Okay, so the, you know, Sean looks at the rabbi like, that's, that's your test of logic? The rabbi says, yep. So Sean says, obviously the one with the dirty face washes his face. The rabbi says, wrong. The one with the clean face washes his face. And it's simple logic, right? Because the, the one with the dirty face looks at the one with the clean face and he thinks his face is clean. And the one with the clean face looks at the one with the dirty face and he thinks his face is dirty. So the one with the clean face uh, ends up washing his face. So Sean says, you know, okay, very clever. G you know, give me another test. The rabbi says, you want another, an another logic test? Two men come down the chimney. One comes out with a clean face. The other one comes out with a dirty face. Which one washes his face? So Sean says, well, we've already established that the one with the clean face washes his face. So the rabbi says, wrong. They both wash their face. Okay, and it's simple logic. The one with the dirty face looks at the one with the clean face. He thinks that his own face is clean. The one with the, the, one with the clean face looks at the one with the dirty face and thinks his face is dirty. So the one with the clean face washes his face. And when the one with the dirty face sees the one with the clean face washing his face, he also washes his face uh, because he realizes that the clean person with the clean face realized, dirt, you know, and, you know, thought his own face was dirty. So Sean says, uh, well, I didn't think of that. Okay. And, uh, you know, honestly, like I'm surprised at myself that I missed that. So give me another test. Rabbi says, you want another test? Okay. Two men come down a chimney and one comes out with a clean face and the other one comes out with a dirty face. Which one washes his face? So he says, well, we just said that each one washes his face. The rabbi says, no, you're wrong. Neither one washes his face. And it's simple logic. The one with the dirty face looks at the one with the clean face and thinks his face is clean. The one with the clean face looks at the one with the dirty face and thinks his face is dirty. But when the one with the clean face sees the one with the dirty face, not washing his face, he realizes that his own face is clean. So neither one washes his face. So, you know, this, Sean is desperate. He says, you know, I, I know I can study the Talmud. I can figure this out. Give me one more test. So the rabbi asks again, two men come down a chimney. One comes out with a clean face. The other comes out with a dirty face. Which one washes his face? So he says, neither one washes his face. And the rabbi says, you're wrong. You see, you know, the Socratic method, as, as, as great as it is, it's insufficient if you want to come study the Talmud um, because it's a very, very simple issue that you missed. How is it possible for two men to come down the same chimney and for one to come out with a clean face and the other to come out with a dirty face? Don't you see the whole question, the whole basis, the foundation for this question is Narishkeit. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's stupidity. It's stupidity. And if you try your whole life to answer stupid questions, you know, then your questions are going to be foolish as well. That's, uh, that's the story. And I think 
you know, as funny as it is and as, you know, absurd as it may sound, that is the, the, the Talmudic method, the Talmudic way of thinking. It's the ability to look at an, a given issue, uh, you know, from a hundred different angles. And imagine if you took, you know, a beautiful diamond and you stared at it and uh, you said, well, I've, I've seen all there is to see in this diamond. Um, you know, a, you know, a jeweler would tell you, no, you haven't seen anything yet. You've only seen the surface. You need to turn it. You need to look at it in the light and see all the different facets of the diamond. And that's when you perceive the true beauty. So the Talmudic method of analyzing everything from a bunch of different angles and being able to see the same problem and uh, find 10 different solutions to it is, um, is the way that we get at the beauty and at the depth of what the Torah teaches us. So, you know, I, that's why I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm excited to study Talmud with all of you because uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a great journey. And I hope, I think you'll all enjoy and I hope you truly do. So let's get, you know, basics, right? Start at the beginning. What is the Talmud? Okay, we, we hear that word, it's thrown around. Um, it's this, you know, a lot of people, a rabbi will quote something and you'll ask, well, where does it say that? He'll say in the Talmud. Well, the Talmud is a vast body of knowledge. Okay, it's, it's a summary of the oral law of Judaism and it evolved over centuries. Um, centuries of rabbis um, toiling over the meaning of the Torah. Uh, these rabbis lived in Israel and Babylonia during the time of the second temple period all the way through the destruction of the temple and up until uh, the beginning of the Middle Ages or around 500 CE. And these rabbis lived both in Israel and Babylonia. Those were the two centers of Jewish, Jewish scholarship. And when we say the word Talmud, we are referring to the entirety of the oral law, but that's divided up into two parts, okay? We have the Mishnah. The Mishnah is written in Hebrew, and that was compiled around the year 200 CE by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda the Prince. Um, and it is written... Um, in a very concise, tight format. And that was the first time that the oral law or halacha, Jewish law, was written down. Um, you know, we, we, we call it the oral law because from when the Torah was given at Mount Sinai until it was finally written down um, some, you know, thousand plus years later, it was passed orally from teacher to student um, it was taught, but it was not written down. And when it was written down, it was only for the short term. Those um, documents were hidden or destroyed uh, because it was supposed to be maintained as the oral law. Rabbi Judah the Prince, when he wrote the Mishnah, it was because he recognized, um, you know, after the destruction of the temple, that there was no longer a central um, body for the Jewish community. The Jewish community was dispersed throughout the Middle East and throughout the world or the known world. And it would be impossible to maintain this tradition, um, you know, from teacher to student, et cetera. It had to be written down in order to uh, keep it alive. So that's the Mishnah. And then we have what's known as the Talmud specifically, um, or otherwise known as Gemara, uh, which is written in Aramaic and kind of a mix of Hebrew. Um, and that's a summary of the discussions and commentary and the elucidation of the Mishnah. So the Mishnah is written very tight. Every single word is weighed um, and every single idea is the kernel for um, a vast body of knowledge of, of where you apply the law. And the Talmud is, is breaking that down and expounding upon that into a variety of different problems um, and situations that that arose and that will arise. So it's it's uh, the the Gemara, the, the Talmud, is a commentary on the Mishnah. So that's the uh, you know the basic definition, uh, but it doesn't do it 
you know, justice, because the Talmud beyond law, um, it contains thousands of years of Jewish wisdom, um, legends, philosophy, abstract logic, um, and practical applications, you know, of, of the law. It contains um, Jewish history, it contains um, references to science, um, as science was in those days. You have a lot of stories, and of course you have jokes. You have Talmudic humor, uh, which is its own flavor of humor. Um, and essentially every kind of definition that you're going to try to give to the Talmud um, is going to be a superficial definition. And it kind of evades definition, ultimately. Um, the way to, to understand what Talmud is, is to get involved in it, is to study it, engage with it intellectually, engage with it emotionally, become a part of that process of study and, and analysis. Uh, and then by experiencing it, you can really come to a true understanding of what the Talmud is. Um, okay. That's uh, as far as, you know, the what of Talmud. Why is it important to study Talmud? Um, the word Talmud itself means study, okay? So when, when I ask the question, why is it important to study Talmud is, you know, obviously the, um, if you look at it purely as a legal document, it is not the ultimate when it comes to Jewish law. Uh, Jewish law is codified, you know, both by Maimonides and by the Shulchan Aruch into you shall do this, you shall not do that, um, you know, daily living, holidays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you want to know the law, you study, you know, the, the codified Jewish law. Why study the Talmud? And I think the simple answer would be that if you know, we, we all study the Torah, right? We know it's important to study the Torah because it's the foundation of Judaism. Well, if the Torah, the written law is the foundation of Judaism, then the Talmud is the central pillar of the building of Judaism, okay? All of uh, Jewish wisdom, law, ethics, theology, and philosophy hinge on this central pillar. So if you want to live as a Jew, and connect with what Judaism is, it's important not just to study the foundation, but to explore that central pillar to try to understand what all of Jewish life hinges on. Um, and the goal of the Talmud is not just about um, arriving at a legal conclusion, right? You, you shall do this, you shall not do that. Um, the word Talmud, like I mentioned, means to study. The goal of the Talmud is the study itself. So, you know, the journey is the, is the destination, which is why, although, you know, it, you know, today we have many tools at our disposal that will make it very easy to study the Talmud, we still use those tools as a kind of uh, study aid, right? We use them to help us in our journey, right? Whether it's, the, you know, to get through some of the Aramaic translations or to help clarify a particularly tough point, but we don't study straight from a study aid, which is why, you know, in today's lesson and in further lessons, we're going to look at the page of the Talmud in the original, uh, or the original printed format of the Talmud, the way it was studied for centuries, because that's a lot of the process is deciphering it um, and really analyzing it on your own, because, you know, that's where the, that's where you strike gold. Um, the, the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot tells us, turn it and turn it again for everything is contained in the Torah. Uh, regard it and grow old in it and never abandon it for there is no greater virtue. So the, the you know, the, the sage in the, in Pirkei Avot is trying to tell us, you know, turn it and turn it like, you know, dig and keep digging. Uh, and appreciate that journey of digging, appreciate that journey of, of analyzing and trying to understand because that's where, um, that's where the gold is. 
And, you know, when studying it, what our goal is to aim at a basic understanding of the text of, you know, what is the Mishnah saying, right? And what is, what are the sages of the Talmud uh, trying to, uh, to ask or what, what is their answer? What is their analysis of it? What is their explanation of it? And once we've come to a basic understanding of it, the student of the Talmud um, begins to analyze it, you know, on their own. And that's, that's all of us. There's room for us to, you know, stop and say, well, why did, you know, the, why did the rabbi ask that question? He could have asked a better question and, you know, see it from the context of our own lives and our own experience. And in that way, we become kind of a part of the process of Talmud. Um, and one final point before we jump into the actual study of the, uh, the tractate that we're going to start with today is the oral law, right? What, you know, I keep saying oral law and uh, what is it? And, and when did it begin? Like when did, when did the oral law start? And uh, you know, what is it, right? Most people know about the written law, right? The five books of Moses. So in essence, the oral law is a tradition passed down from teacher to student all the way back to Moses. So it begins at Mount Sinai at the same time that the Torah, the five books of Moses was given. And when I say written law, I refer to the five books of Moses and the oral law is the explanation of the five books of Moses. And how do we know that there, you know, that the oral law existed all the way back then? Um, so there's a couple of points here. Every written law uh, by default contains an oral tradition uh, just by virtue of it uh, you know of a written law using words because the meaning of words is not the same from one generation to the next so take you know, a document like you know the uh, the constitution of the united states well that's a document that needs to be explained and applied you know in every generation to the specific, you know, issues that, that, you know, that face the country. Um, and just on the basic level, the document was written a few hundred years ago, and we need to understand what those words meant. What, you know, what was the intention of the scholars who wrote it, um, you know, when, when, when they used the words that they used. So let's, you know, take that metaphor over to the Torah. So the Torah uses words to convey ideas, um, but teachers, from, from the moment the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, needed to teach the meaning of the words, especially when it comes to questions of, um, you know, animals, plants, objects, things that, you know, words that are very unique and specific. So um, throughout the oral law, we have explanations of what these things are. Uh, such as all the descriptions of the various animals that are kosher and not kosher and birds that are kosher. Um, one very interesting tidbit of lost knowledge uh, that even by the time that, you know, the Talmud was compiled, we had lost that knowledge. It was not transmitted properly was the names of the insects in the Torah that are kosher. Yes, there are insects that are kosher. The problem is we don't know what they are because the names are biblical and very specific. Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an example of some, you know, a word that was specific and was lost to the next generation. But take, a, take an example of a word like totafot, like we say in the Shema, which is a quote from the written Torah, they shall be as totafot bene necha, right? The words of the Torah should be totafot. It's a very obscure word, but from the beginning, um, the idea was transmitted from Moses to Joshua and from Joshua to the 70 elders that totafot is the tefillin, right? It's a black box containing parchment. Um, and we know that from ancient times, from antiquity, we have, you know, the, the remnants of tefillin. So that's the first reason why, the first way we know or the reason why we would have an oral law is to uh, transmit the definitions of the words of the Torah. In addition, um, the Torah contains general concepts. 
um, the Torah says, don't do work on Shabbat. Dwell in a booth for seven days. Well, what type of work is work, right? And what type of, uh, what is a booth that I should dwell in? What kind of booth? What does it look like? So the oral law is a, you know, is, is a tradition that's transmitted regarding how do we specifically apply these general concepts? Uh, you know, the example that we use, don't do labor on Shabbat. Well, the, the tradition was conveyed by Moses, and Joshua, and so on, all the way, you know, down through the centuries, that the labor mentioned in the Torah is the labor that was done in the temple, 39 specific acts and their offshoots and derivatives, that constitutes labor, and that's what we don't do on Shabbat. Dwell in a booth for seven days, it needs to be a temporary structure, the ceiling needs to be made out of greenery. Um, and then we have the sukkah as we know it in today's day and age. Um, and then in, obviously in every generation, the scholars need to analyze, you know, new issues that come up, um, technology, technological advancements, uh, you know, when they discovered how to make a circular sukkah, they asked, well, is a circular sukkah allowed or is it not allowed, you know? What if I take a tree that's still connected to the ground and bend it over the, you know, the, the top of the sukkah without cutting off the branches? You know, does that work or not? Well, that's all part of the oral law, again, applying these general concepts in the Torah. And then we have in the Torah itself um, customs and facts that are hinted to uh, that the Torah clearly is saying that there is a user manual to accompany the uh the written law or 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 in our case an oral tradition not a user's manual but you need to turn to the previous generation to ask them what is the tradition with regard to this uh, the torah says clearly with regard to ritual slaughter you shall slaughter the animals as i have commanded you where did where did god command us with regard to how to slaughter the animals right so the oral tradition is obviously from Moses that and it was transmitted to Moses from God in these instances um, where it says, as I have commanded you, Moses gave over that knowledge to Joshua and the tradition continued with regard to ritual slaughter, all of the details of it. Um, you know, the Torah speaks, when, it's, when the Torah speaks about divorce, it says, write a bill of divorce. Well, what is a bill of divorce, right? The Torah is clearly um, pointing to the fact that there is a custom um, and specific knowledge and traditions around how this is supposed to be done. And that is uh, transmitted orally from generation to generation. Um, and the oral law has a framework, rules and a framework for how do we analyze and how do we apply the written law to various marginal cases and new instances. This kind of an approach to it that was used throughout the century Centuries, uh, the millennia, um, the shalosh esrei midos shator and the dreshet, the thirteen, um, the thirteen principles through which we analyze and elucidate the Torah. So that was the work of the sages from the year two four four eight on the Jewish calendar, uh, all the way up until you know, and, and through the entire first temple period. Okay. When the Jews got back from Babylonia, uh, they, they um, convened what is known as the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the great assembly. And these, these men, um, they, they had just experienced the first exile from the seat of Jewish power and Jewish um, um, autonomy. So they started to gather all of this wisdom together, all of this decentralized knowledge um, that existed amongst all the rabbis in the Jewish nation and create um, a core consensus around this body of Jewish law. And that continued through the end of the Second Temple period. Um, but then they were disbanded. So the sage Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who experienced you know, the, the destruction of the temple, he took it upon himself to write all of this down. Um, and if he was to write down all of the law, every single possible case that had been discussed and, and um, you know, where, where the, the written law was applied 
it would cover way too many books. It would not be transmissible. It would not be transportable. So he compiled what is known as the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the six orders of the Mishnah. So six general categories, um, and each one is subdivided into various different subjects known as a Mesechet or a Mesechta, um, a tractate. Each one of the tractates dealing with kind of a general body of knowledge. You have, you know, in the order, for example, of Moed, of holidays. So you have a tractate for Shabbat. You have a tractate for Sukkot. You have a tractate for Pesach. You, ha you have a, uh, a tractate for Yom Kippur. You have a tractate, did I say Shabbat? Yeah. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the tractate that we are going to uh, study today is called Tractate Bava Metzia. Okay, it's from the order of Nizikin, which means damages, uh, which deals largely with civil law, law between people, right? Litig civil litigation. Um, and there was one mega mesachat, one big one that they split up into three, um, three gates. Bava Kama, the first gate, Bava Metzia, the middle gate, and Bava Batra, the third gate. We're going to learn uh, the middle one. So this is one out of 62 tractates in the Mishnah. Um, and now after Rabbi Yehuda Nasi compiled the Mishnah for the next 300 years, the, rab the rabbis and sages, both in, in Israel and in Babylonia, um, devoted their lives to um, extracting that knowledge. So the Mishnah is, it, it is, a, is like a zip file and you need to unzip each file and see like, you know, the variety of cases that it can be applied to. And we'll see in it, you know, when we actually get down to studying the Mishnah, you will notice that the Mishnah deals with the most general case possible um, in order to give us, in order to give us, you know, the underlying principles behind the law so that we can now go into specific cases and say, well, oh, does it look more like this or does it look more like that? Um, and then apply the law to it. And that's, that's the work of the, of the Gemara or the Talmud. So without further ado, um, let's throw this up on the screen, opening the Talmud. Let's bring your shared window to the front. No, stop sharing, let's try this again. Talmud. Share screen. Does everyone see that? Okay, opening the Talmud. Um, first things first, let's go through. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever seen a page of text that looks like this. Um, super complicated, right? Let's try to break it down so it looks so you know once you understand the components it might look less complicated. Um, let's start with number one. Um, number one is the page number, um, and the Masecha this tract they starts on page number two, page one being the cover page, um, and you see the bet for two. Uh, and the dot next to the bet, what does that dot symbolize? Well, every page in the Talmud is really a folio. So it's both sides of a single page. So whenever you're studying the Talmud and you, you know, somebody gives you a, um, you know, you see a footnote or somebody wants to quote a page, they'll tell you it was bet Amud Aleph, uh, which is column, which is page two, column one, um, which means this side of the, of the page, the first side of the page, and bet amud bet is the flip side of the page. Um, if you are looking in a book, an actual book, so amud aleph is always going to be on the left side, and then amud bet is going to be on your right side. So bet amud aleph, bet amud bet. Okay, fairly simple. A little, a little bit, you know, nothing could be too straightforward in the Talmud, so we had to complicate it just a little bit um, and give each page number two sides of a page. Um, Number two here is the name of the Masechet. It's the name of the tractate that we're studying. Like I mentioned, this one is called Bava Metzia. Those of you who are familiar with Hebrew, um, 
or Aramaic written in Hebrew, uh, in, in a Hebrew font, uh, you'll be able to read that. If you're not familiar with Hebrew, I'll translate everything. So don't worry about trying to decipher it. Bava Metzia, the middle gate, again, in this uh, larger context of studying civil litigation. Uh, number three, chapter number, Perak Rishon, chapter number one. Number four, Shnaim Ochazin. So much like a, a Parsha in the Torah would have a name that we call the Parsha. So every single uh, chapter in every tractate is given a name as well. And the name is given based on the first two words of the chapter, Shnaim Ochazin, uh, which in this case means two people holding. And we'll get to that in just a minute, what they're holding and why. Um, number five, see this big box here? Um, just for ceremonial purposes, when you see a page of the Talmud and has a big ornate box on top of the page containing the first word of the tractate, it's because it's the first page of a, of, of a tractate. You won't see that throughout the rest of, of, of this tractate, but you know, next tractate again, it'll have that big ornate, um, you know, welcome mat to this, uh, to the specific topic that we're studying. Um, now, the Talmud always starts off, like I mentioned, with a quote from the Mishnah. So from the beginning until this little bold font here, this is the Mishnah right here. Again, compiled by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, very tight format, um, and it's all elucidated over the coming pages in the Gemara. So number six, you see these two letters here, Gimel Mem. Those are the first two letters of Gemara. It's a little abbreviated um, signal that, hey, here's where the commentary starts. This is, the, this is the, the Gemara part of the Talmud that we're going to study from here on. And it will continue um, in this font for a few pages until further on you'll see the words Mishnah, which lets you know, okay, we finished the discussion of that Mishnah. We're going on to the next Mishnah, um, study that Mishnah, and then move into the Gemara part of it. Okay, number seven. Uh, so, again, the middle pillar, just for you all to know, is the, uh, contains the Mishnah and the Gemara, and on the right and left and on the margins, you have various commentaries and tools to get you through the study of the Mishnah and the Gemara. Number one, which you're always going to look to first when trying to decipher what the Mishnah is saying and what the Gemara is saying, is Rashi. Okay, this commentary on the right side is Rashi, my, um, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, sage from you know the Middle Ages. He lived in France. He is probably the most prolific commentator on, you know, in the Torah, both the written law. He wrote a commentary on all of the five books of Moses, the foremost commentary that gives us the basic understanding of the Torah, and he also wrote a commentary to the entire Talmud, although we don't have his commentary. Uh, we don't have the, the full manuscript, but for most of the Talmud, you will have Rashi's commentary on the right side of the page. And just an interesting little anecdote, it's not always on the right side of the page. It's on the right side of the page on, on, uh, on Amud Aleph, when you're on, this, when you're on the page on the left, if that's, if that's your book right here. So when you're on the left page, it'll be on the right side. When you're on the right page, it'll be on the left side. In essence, when you're looking at the book, it'll always be on the inside column, okay? Um, and it, the, the legend that I heard, the reason for this is, is because, you know, at the advent of the printing press, when, this, when the Talmud was originally um, formatted like this in Vilna, you know, a few hundred years ago, the um, print was very expensive and books um, were very valuable, but they deteriorated very easily, right? Whether it's from, you know, rain, uh, mold, you know, you, critters getting into them. Um, and the nature of books is they deteriorate from the outside in. So if you keep Rachi on the inner column, it'll last the longest. So whereas other commentaries are somewhat dispensable, Rashi is indispensable. So Rashi is always going to be on the inside column 
of, of your page of the Talmud. Um, so when studying the Talmud, most people will keep a finger on the place in the center column and then look to the right where they'll see the bold text quoting from the Mishnah or the Gemara and then the regular text is, um, is explaining, is giving his, his, his commentaries or, or his explanation on what the Talmud is trying to say or why the Talmud is saying that. On the left side or on the outside column of the Talmud is what is known as the Tosafot, which is a group of scholars, mostly Rashi's descendants, his grandchildren and great grandchildren, um, also lived in France and Germany in the Middle Ages, and they wrote um, a commentary which is a little more zoomed out. Okay, it's trying to cross reference the Talmud with other places in the Talmud, compare and contrast, um, and gain knowledge of the subject matter by that, you know, comparison um, and contrasting, okay? So that's, uh, that's the Tosafot. And we'll, you know, we'll study both Rashi and the Tosafot on a given day. Um, although Rashi, again, is where you want to start. Tosafot is if you want to go a little bit deeper and come to a deeper understanding of the subject matter. Uh, where are we? Number nine, Mesorah Sashas. Okay, this is a, um, a footnote, essentially, a tool for cross-referencing to other places in the Talmud where the same ideas are mentioned or the same subject matter is discussed. Um, and you'll see the call-out, okay? The call-out for each of these little tools on the right and left is different. You see, this one starts with a little, um, is it, well, it's a different font than you're used to, but that's an aleph with a parenthesis. Well, the call out for it is right there at the beginning of the Mishnah. Um, so that'll tell you, oh, look to Masora Tashas. That'll give you the ability to cross-reference with other places in the Talmud. Um, number, okay, we are, we don't have that much time. So I'm going to leave the rest of these for another time. Um, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Let's just say they are various glosses on the text that you have on the page um, and various tools for um, learning more about whatever's on the page. So that should give you a basic idea of the anatomy of a page of Gemara. So I hope by now your initial reaction of looking at this like, wow, what is all this script? Um, I think it'll it start to take some shape and you have some more knowledge of, of, of what's going on over here. Um, and again, I don't expect anyone to be able to study outright just, you know, reading the Hebrew and translating or reading the Aramaic and translating. But what, you know, when using a tool um, like Sepharia.org or like the Schottenstein edition of the Talmud or the Steinzels edition of the Talmud, both of which have English translations, you wouldn't just read the straight English translation and just, you know, barrel your way through it. You would gain an understanding of the translation of a few lines and then you would go and study it on this page the original um, and work your way through it uh, at your own pace so let's uh let's get to it okay let's get to the study of this mission and what we're going to do is study a few lines and then look at rashi um, see how Rashi works and look at Tosafot and see, you know, what they say and see if we can gain a little bit of a deeper understanding of, you know, of the Mishnah after studying it at the superficial level. All right, is everybody ready? Let's go. Okay. Shnayim Ochazin Batalis. Two people appear in court holding on to a garment. Okay, Talis. Right, everybody, uh, you, you hear the word talus, you're thinking of the, the black striped garment with the tassels on the side. In this case, talus is just, you know, the generic word denoting a garment. Two people come into court holding onto a garment. Ze Omer, ani mitzasiha. This one, one of them says, I found it. Ze Omer, ani mitzasiha. The other one says, I found it. Ze Omer, kula sheli. This one says, it's all mine. 
The other one says, no, it's all mine. Okay. So what's going on here is we have a case of a, a lost object, right? Third party lost it. And there is no, again, the, the, the mission seems to take the, the most general possible um, case. Uh, for example, if there were a, a, an identifying sign on the garment, like somebody had his initials monogrammed on it, well, yeah, the, the, that's, that's not what the mission is talking about. Um, that would obviously, you know, we'd have to search for the owner and return it to him. We're talking about a garment here with no um, identifying, um, with no identifying signs on it. And the rule with a lost object and no identifying signs is finders keepers. Okay, these guys come to court and um, they have a dispute with regard to who was the finder. Each one claims that they found it first. And, and uh, or, yeah, they found it first. We'll, we'll understand from the Gemara how we know that that's their claim that they found it first. And what does finding it mean, right? Did they see it first? Did they approach it first? Well, in any case, somehow both of them grabbed onto it and both of them want to claim complete ownership of it. So what does the court do? Right, the court needs to step in here and render render a ruling. Who does it belong to? So here's what the the Mishnah says: Ze Yishava, she'ein lo ba pachos mechetzia. This one swears that he does not own less than half of the half of it. Ze Yishava, she'ein lo ba pachos mechetzia, and the other one swears that he does not own less than half of it. Viachloku and they divide it, right? They don't divide the garment by cutting it in half. That would, you know, render it useless. They divide the value of the garment um, after it is sold on the free market. So what's this idea of swearing? Um, and we'll get into that, um, you know, both in this class and later classes. But the basic idea of the oath is um, that in the Ten Commandments, there is a um, commandment number three, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you shall not take my name in vain, uh, which means you shall not swear in God's name untruthfully. Um, so the way to verify that what you're saying is true, or the way to establish a claim to something in Talmudic law um, the very, very, very minimal way is you need to be willing to swear, okay, in court while holding a safer Torah, okay? They take the Torah scroll and put the fear of God in you, okay, that you, you know, sh you, sh you should not swear falsely. Um, and then that kind of gives your claim a degree of truthfulness because, uh, you know, who's going who's gonna to lie when holding on to a Torah and swearing? So... Um, Yeshava, each of them needs to take an oath, okay, and, and, and it's, it's an interesting, interestingly worded, you know, um, and it's worded that way, I think, on a, you know, if we can just say very basically, you don't swear that it's all mine, even though that's your claim, because if you swear that it's all yours, it can't, you know, it can't be all of your, you both can't take an oath saying that it's all yours because one of you is obviously lying. But you can't either take an oath that it's half, half of it is mine because you truly believe that the whole thing is yours. So the wording of the oath is, um, I own at least half of it, okay? Which will um, kind of lock in your claim to, to, to the half that belongs to you and then you, um, you know, share the value of the garment, essentially. You know, you split it 50-50. So that's the Mishnah, case number one in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah goes on to discuss other cases. Um, but we're going to stop here for a minute and analyze this, right? That's what Tom is all about. Analyze it. So let's, um, let's jump to Rashi. Okay. Uh, back up here on the top. Zoom in a little bit. Okay. Shnayim ochazim batalis. Two people holding on to, are, uh, you know, are holding on to a garment. 
That's, you know, the bold script here, quote from the Mishnah. Rashi says, Davka Ochazin. Specifically, in the case where they are both holding on to the garment. Both of them have a claim to it, but, you know, and one does not have more of a claim than the other. Okay? If it was all in one person's hands, the Rashi says, you know, the, the wording of the mission is specific in order to teach us a general rule, okay, in Talmudic thinking and in Jewish law. And this rule is pretty much across the board. A um, good friend of mine, he's a lawyer, and he always tells me, you know, one of the most important um, most important um, rules in law is that um, possession is nine tenths of the law. And it's kind of like that in the Talmud as well. When I have something in my possession, it is difficult for you to remove it from my possession, right? Because we have, we respect something called the status quo or chazaka. Chazaka means strength or ownership or a claim. So the biggest claim that I can have to something is when it's in my possession, right? This pen is in my pocket. It belongs to me. You're screaming, you know, you stole it from me, right? Or, or I bought it from you. Or, you know, I lent it to you, but I want it back. Well, all of those things are, you know, good and fine, but you're going to need to bring some proof to your claim right? The burden of proof belongs, you know, lays on the shoulders of the one who wants to remove it from another person's possession. So if we were talking about a talus, you know, a garment, two people came to court and one person is holding it and the other person is saying, no, it's mine. Well, then the burden of proof would be a lot more than just an oath. He'd have to bring, you know, witnesses that say, that they saw him wearing that garment or, you know, a receipt that said that he bought the garment or, you know, you know, if he says he, you know, he lent the garment to the other guy, well then you, you have a receipt for when you lend something. There's, you know, you, you got to have some kind of documentation or some kind of witnesses to prove your claim. Okay. So that's, you know, that's a general rule throughout the, um, throughout the Talmud. It goes like this, Hamotzi Mechavero, one who seeks to extract something from his fellow, a love haraya upon him is the proof. He needs to bring proof to it. Um, so in this case, Rashi says, the Mishnah was very specific to say they were both holding on to it. So neither of them has that chazaka. Nobody has a claim to it more than the other one. Okay, so how does the how does the, uh, the, the court, ha you know, award each one half? They say, well, here's what we do. We'll give you the benefit. Uh, we'll allow you to take an oath, okay? Because, you know, we trust that both of you are upstanding citizens. Take this oath, and that oath will be, you know, will be a claim to ownership for the garment, and the claim to ownership is half of it, and you'll take your half. Is that clear? That's, that's Rashi's understanding of this first law in the Mishnah. Um, Tosafot, on the other hand, you know, he comes with a different approach. And like I mentioned before, Tosafot, most of the time will cross-reference, will bring you another case that looks the same, but is not the same from somewhere else in the Talmud and, you know, force you to reason your way out of, you know, out of the contradiction or the difference between them. So this uh, Tosafot over here, the second one on the left side, the Achloku, he says, they divide it. Tosafot says, Tema. Tema, the word Tema is, uh, is a question. Okay, it's a, it's a wonder. Like, it, you know, mind-boggling. Demai Shana, why is it different, Meahi de Arba, from that case of the boat? The Omar called Alam Gavar, Parak Chezka So in another tractate, 
which is called Baba Batra, in the Perak, in the chapter called Cheskas Habatim, and there's the, um, the, uh, the reference, Lamed Dalad, second side of the page, okay? There's a, there's a story about a boat, and over there the court takes a radically different approach, okay? The story on, in, in Baba Basra, we're not gonna look it up now, but I'll tell you because I looked it, I looked it up before. Um, two people come into the court and they have a similar dispute, you know? And they're talking about, not about a garment that they're holding, but about a ship in the harbor, okay? Um, this one says, hey, it's all mine. And the other one says, no, it's all mine. What does the court tell them? In that case, it's um, the court refuses to um, apply itself, uh, uh, refuses to, you know, the court is, is an institution and needs to protect its integrity, okay? And it's not about to insert itself into a situation where there is, you know, no legal basis to render a ruling. So two people come into court and each one is saying it belongs to me. Um, the court tells them, called the Olim Gavar. It means let the stronger one prevail. I mean, like fight it out, right? And, until somebody brings, you know, a proof of ownership, a deed or a sign or witnesses or something, we have nothing to go on, you know, go, go race to the harbor and, uh, and see, see who could, who could take possession of the ship faster. In essence, in that case, the, 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 um, the court does not render a decision. And in this case, the court says split it. So what's the difference? Why in our case are they allowed to, um, why, why does the court award them each half? And in that case, the court um, removes itself from the discussion. What's the difference between them? Anybody want to venture a guess? or you know a hypothesis or a uh, your own analysis for what the difference might be between this case and that case maybe could it be it's difficult to prove a personal garment but wouldn't people in the public know who the owner is of a boat of a ship uh, maybe but maybe they just you know docked here in the boston harbor coming from new york nobody knows who you know who's who they come running into the basin, you know, with, with, with an argument. Um, but is there some kind of certificate showing, a bill of sale showing you bought it, maybe? So deeds um, and bills of ownership are something that, that, that evolved, like, culturally, you know, historically over a period of time. Um, and depending on where you were and what kind of city, you may or may not have, have had a deed, um, a deed of ownership, like a proof of ownership. The, um, uh -huh. I guess... When it comes to levels of proof in Talmudic thinking, the ultimate proof that you can have is two witnesses. Um, okay. Those are, you know, that's the top, right? Because we have, you know, people, two other people verifying your ownership of it, and they are subject to interrogation, and we can, you know, verify their truthfulness. Um, deeds are forgeable, not always verifiable, but they still work. And, you know, the lowest level is, is like a... You know, the entry level claim to ownership is no. Um, so the um, Tosafot explains the difference, right? And he contrasts between our case and that case. He says, Oh, Shani, when they're holding on to it, is different. He says, he says, the difference between this case and that case is that case, neither of them is holding it, right? Neither of them is on the ship. They're in Beit Din. You know, we have nothing to go on. We have no witnesses whatsoever. Whereas when they come into court, both holding on to the garment, the court itself is the witness or are the witnesses that each one owns half. We talked before about chazaka, possession. Each one possesses half of this garment. It's clear as day to us. So Tosafot goes on to, you know, to ask, then why do we need them to swear? So the, you know, the answer is essentially that we're not so naive as to think that, that you know, talus snatchers don't exist, right? The, you know, there are no good nicks everywhere. And when we're talking about a garment, there, there's obviously the, the, you know, the chance that one of them 
you know, you know, in an opportunistic way, saw an in and just, you know, grabbed it after one had full ownership of it. So the oath, according to Tosafot, is, um, is like an afterthought, right? The ownership is determined by virtue of both of them holding it. And the oath is a pressure point, is to say, you know, just make sure that I know both of you are acting in good faith, right? Uh, that one of you is not lying. Because, you know, there's, there's, there's a high chance that when the court says, well, both of you have to take an oath if you're going to walk out of here, one of them might say, ah, I don't want to take an oath. You know, I don't, I don't want that on me. And then we know that, you know, his claim was, wasn't so truthful. Um, so the, the, according to Tosafot, um, it, it's a little bit of a different understanding of the issue than Rashi. And this might bring to mind the story of the chimney, as we spoke about earlier, splitting hairs a little bit. Okay, according to Rashi, according to Rashi, um, the garment belongs to neither of them until they take an oath, right? And the oath is a privilege granted to them by Beitin to establish ownership. Um, and the, according to Tosafot, they both have ownership already by virtue of them holding on to it. Um, and the oath is an afterthought to make sure that one of them is not lying. They sound very similar, don't they? Yeah. Right? <laughs> As my teacher in, in, in yeshiva used to say, let me give you a for instance. Um, let's, let's find a third example <laughs> of, uh, uh, you know, of an area where we will see the difference between Rashi and Tosafot. What if I give you a case, um, a fact scenario, where I know for a fact that one of them is lying. For example, uh, this is discussed elsewhere in the Talmud. Um, both of them come to Beitin <laughs> with a garment and one of them says, I wove this garment. And the other one says, no, I wove this garment. Okay. So one of them is clearly lying right? Both of them cannot be telling the truth, right? Uh, if one of them wove it, then the other one didn't, and, and, and vice versa. So according to Tosafot, we have a perfect, we have a perfect solution. We employ the oath as that pressure point to force one of them out of their claim, okay? And according to Rashi, we wouldn't do anything. The court would take that garment and, you know, put it into holding, right, in a warehouse somewhere until we have more information. Because according to Rashi, we don't employ the oath as a pressure point where we think someone is lying. According to Rashi, we use the oath to give two people acting in good faith a claim to a garment. But where one of them is clearly not acting in good faith, we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow them to swear. We wouldn't split the garment. So that's... that's um. An interesting, you know, difference between Rashi and Tosafot, although they look very similar, they come at this, this you know, this, this uh, idea of the oath and the garment from two different angles. And you'll see that um, this discussion summarized in the last page over here, um, the difference between Rashi and Tosafot, if it's not clear, I mean, I'll try to, to, um, to, uh, clarify it now, but if you want to, you know, this is for further reading um, the difference between Rashi and Tosafot with regard to the Mishnah's oath. Um, and here are some of the terms that we discussed. Chazaka, right, the uh, status quo, the assumed status, and uh, the law that Hamotzi mechavera lav haraya, if somebody wants to change the status quo, uh, they need to bring the proof. Um, it's 9.03, so I think we're going to stop for today and carry this discussion forward next week through the rest of the Mishnah and the Gemara. If somebody needs to um, jump off to run to another Zoom meeting or, or otherwise, um, feel free to go. Otherwise, I'll take questions and um, try to clarify some of the things we spoke about today. Miriam, yes. I have a quick question before I get back to getting ready for Shabbos, but um, obviously one of them is lying, 
right? They can't be two owners of anything unless they butt it together, right? So if they both are gonna take this oath, like Rashi says they can both have this privilege, would one of them that's lying could actually take a, an oath and be, I mean, that's such a, a vile thing to do. You know? So in, in our Mishnah, in, you know, the, the, the case scenario that we're talking about um, here, the, there is a chance, there's a possibility that they both saw this garment laying on the street and they both ran to grab it, grab it oh. at the same time. Okay. That's, that's the assumption that they're acting in good faith. Yeah. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if they both take the oath, neither's really lying. Yeah. And, and the, the, the wording of the oath is also, like I said before, set up so that they're claiming at least half and then they take half. Right. So but that's different from the ship's thing, the boat. <laughs> right. One's lying there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. This is sure. great stuff. Um, any other questions? <laughs> All righty. So we will see everyone here next week um, at hopefully, again, Thursday night at 8, at eight o'clock. Um, lock out, you know, block that time on your calendar. Um, and I will send you uh, the textbook in advance. And uh, what else was there? Oh, I mentioned some resources that you may even want to start um, looking at today. My favorite resource, um, because it's free. Um, hang on one second. So here's a really cool resource, which, um, am I sharing my screen? I'm not sharing my screen. Okay, share screen and share that window. Okay, this is called sepharia.org, S-E-F-A-R-I-A.org. Um, and let's just bring you to the homepage so you'll see what you'll see when you, when you get there. Uh, so you want to, Scroll down or search for Talmud. Talmud. Okay. This is the entirety of the Talmud. You want to find the, you know, the track date that you're studying. You know, like I mentioned, the Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, etc. We are in Seder Nezikin, Bava Metzia. This one right here. And there is our Mishnah. Um, and because it's online, you have this beautiful um, functionality, which is um, when you need a commentary, for example, um, you know, this is just the Mishnah with the translation, okay? You click on the Mishnah, and this bar pops up over here, and you click on commentary, and there you have Rashi's commentary. Okay, as I discussed, as we discussed, and you have it both in Hebrew and in English. You click the Aleph to switch between Hebrew and English. Um, this is, it's amazing, amazing the amount of knowledge that you have on this online library. Um, definitely of um, Audible, although, like I mentioned, there is something special to reading it from the original. Um, you know, the way it's formatted and studied for centuries, that's a great tool. Like if you're, if you're, you're stuck on one point, you're having a hard time, or if you just don't have a Talmud in your house, you don't have, a, you know, the, the book to read from um, uh -huh. in your hands, great place to start. If you're looking to get involved in studying the Talmud, I recommend either the Schottenstein edition of the Talmud. Um, that's S-C-H-O-T-T-E-N-S-T-E-I-N, Schottenstein edition. And it's published by Art Scroll. Um, and that was the, you know, like, I guess it's, it's a major undertaking, a print project of a translation of the Talmud with Rashi and Tosafos' commentary. Um, and that was done simultaneously by the Schottenstein edition. And then there's another publisher out of Israel that published the Zal's <laughs> edition or the Koren that's an easier way to search for it is the Koren Talmud, K-O-R-E-N, uh, Koren edition of the Talmud. Um, those are, you know, if, if you're ready to make an investment in buying 
like an actual physical book. Um, so yeah, those are some resources. Enjoy. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. You're very welcome. Thank you. Have a good Shabbos. Thank you. Take care, everyone.